I, I've been I've been doing this for a long time, so I always like to put the title slide up first, so everyone can see like you are in the right place. Let's hope. I, I was joking that ten people would show up because like, you know, Drupal is sort of a nerdy little hobby thing for a lot of people, and this is like the nerdiest little corner of that nerdy little hobby. Um, and so either this is a real pain point for you, or you will have no idea what I'm talking about or why it matters. So. But that's fun. So we have an agenda. I put an agenda together. I'm going to explain who I am. I'm going to give you some issue background and some use cases because use cases are important. Um, I'm going to show you what we've done in the past. I'm going to show you what's up in Drupal 8. I'm going to make a modest proposal for what we do in core. Um, and we're going to talk about things that block this from actually happening. I, wow, 25 people. Two and a half, 250 percent more than I expected. That's awesome. Um, I'm Ken Rickard. I work for Palantir.net, which is a Chicago-based uh, Drupal strategy design and development firm. Uh, I've been around Drupal since 4.5, um, I think 12 years now. Um, I'm the domain access maintainer. Um, we'll show you some s slides of that. Um, domain access actually goes back to Drupal 5. I'm working on the Drupal 8 port right now. Um, I was one of the co-authors of Pro Drupal Development. Someone was asking me at lunch if, if like, at Palantir, we know Drupal. And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I kind of laughed at him. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we know. Um, what, what's really interesting to me, um, a lot of the, co the foundational work that we're going to be talking about, I did the last time I was in Dublin for Dev Days in 2013. Um, and I got to work with uh, Gabor and Alex uh, Pott, who were doing the Configuration Management Initiative. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the work that they've done, particularly around translation. The other thing that I think is a little interesting is I just came out of the, I just came out of the um, imposter syndrome session, and it's funny. This is my twentieth DrupalCon and probably like my thirtieth presentation, but my first core conversation. Because the last time I was on the schedule to do a core conversation, I got bumped because the the one in front of me went long, and they thought it was more important than mine. So there's some imposter syndrome for you. <laughs> to be fair, that was Greg Dunlap talking about configuration management back in like. 2013, I think. <clears throat> okay, issue background. Ooh, fun issue background. So I'm the domain access maintainer. How many people know what that is? Ooh. See, I have groupies. It's real fun. <laughs> I met one at lunch. She was like, you do that? Oh, wow. It's great. So yeah, it comes from Drupal 5. Um, I will tell you for a minute where, where uh, some of domain access comes from, just so you know. It lets you run a group of sites, of course. Um, and one of the things we realized very quickly, um, we were trying to build a bunch of city-based magazine websites. We were based in Georgia, um, and the sales team wanted to be able to go out and sell in other cities. And they immediately said, well, we want to sell this in Los Angeles. And we had worked it out so that you could change the theme and present the right content for those markets. But then one of the other developers went, wait, Los Angeles is in a different time zone. What, what do we do about that? Um, and it turns out that settings.php is a PHP file, so you can do whatever you want to in there, including run lots of code to run configuration overrides, which we used to do raw in settings.php and everyone's good friend, the conferay. So um, I will show you some stuff. These are um, screenshots that I, I, I took from Drupal 6 the other day. But here's a use case, right? So if Hungarian is a default language context, we want the time zone to be a certain thing, and if it's Japanese, we want it to be another thing. Perfectly legitimate use case for what I would consider, when I talk about contextual configuration, this is what I mean. Changing some core value in Drupal's um, underlayer so that things are presented differently depending on the context you come to. I use domain as my proper, my normal context. Language is a context, we'll talk about some others. Um, groups are contexts. Um, that's another common use case. And so, yeah, the Gujarat group on groups.drupal.org might want to have a different time zone presented, right? That's a contextual configuration. Um, can you do it? Um, I, I already answered that. Be, whoops. Yeah, you can. This is how we did it in Drupal 5, 6, and 7, actually, <laughs> is we created giant arrays of forms that let you override se selected variables that were popular um, actually, that's not true. In 5 and 6, and I think in 7, I provided default support for every configuration form in core. Um, and, and then if it was in contrib, the, it was up to the contrib module to use the, uh, the hook here to add their own array of doom. Um, this worked. 
Um, it gave you this lovely page that showed you all the things that were configurable, uh, which gave you this lovely form that showed you all the configurations, and you could change them all at once, right? And it worked. This is, this is actual Drupal 6. Um, doo -doo -doo. So hey, different site, different site. Very exciting. Um, we actually realized in the Drupal lateness, Drupal 6 cycle, there was an easier way to do this, um, and I wrote a domain settings form um, in Drupal. For the, those of you who don't remember, Drupal 6 and 7, there's a system settings form function that was used anytime you wanted to build a system settings form. And you can actually, in a hook form alter, you could read in and say, oh, this is using system settings form. It must be a config form. And then we just overlay our own stuff so you got this, which said, hey, this is a domain sensitive form. You're going to set a contextual variable. Oh, isn't this nice? Um, and I have, you know, here's an example. Uh, this is... Uh, the lovely blue marine theme used for admin on one of my sites. So this is all really cool. It's really nice. It's been expected functionality in some small segments. Like I, like I said, the people who really use this are in the domain world and in the OG world. Um, I don't know if anyone else has cont context that they care about. Um, but what I wanted to do is, so there's the background. Then I want to talk about what's going on in Drupal 8 why you can't do this in Drupal 8, and why we should or should not be able to do this in Drupal 8. Um, and it's a little bit unfair. I said I was here in 2013 working on this stuff. And, and I remember Gabor and Alex were both thrilled because I can do contextual overrides in Drupal 8 right now. Um, and I'll show you how. And then you'll cry. Because they work, which is great, which means the underlying code system works. But I can't do this. Right? Um, and I'll show you why. And what do we do in core? So core configuration, as everyone knows, is giant stacks of YAML files. Hooray! Um, and there are a couple things you can do. You have config overrides, you have config schema, and config translation are all different parts of the system. We'll touch a little bit. Um, and this is what a config file looks like. Everyone's seen these before, right? Um, and you can, using the domain config module, import all or part of a config. Um, schemas, config schemas are so broad and so complex. In, in my world, I don't bother trying to force you to clone the schema, and I don't keep up with that. Um, domain config will actually just um, recursively load as much config as you care to override for a specific context. Um, by default, it actually supports both domain and language, which is really cool. But if you want to change, like, the site name, you have to upload a YAML file following a naming convention, right? right. What's nice is you can actually, the naming convention actually also supports a dot .language element in the string. Um, and for those of you who really care about this stuff, if you have a dot .language dot .domain, it'll look for that first. And then if it doesn't find the dot .language, it'll fall back to the dot .domain, which is really awesome and does show the power of what we have in config management and config overrides. And look, it works. It's Drupal 8. Site 1. Yay, I made a change. Um, now, my assumption had always been the stuff that they're doing in, in config translation, once that's done, all I'll have to do is clone their user interfaces, and boom, I'll have forms for all this stuff. And the rest of the presentation is about why that doesn't work. Hooray. Um, so this is what you get again, uh, with languages, right? And I went ahead and installed Irish on my site because that's the proper thing to do. Um, and you get this config, config translation screen, which actually looks a lot like the domain access screen we saw from Drupal 6. Here's a list of all the things you can translate, right? That's awesome. Um, what I want to show you, I mean, how many of you have actually ever poked at this code? That's one person sheepishly in the front. Um, that doesn't surprise me. Um, this is really complicated stuff. I actually figured this stuff out about nine months ago, and then when writing the presentation, had to spend an hour and a half refreshing my understanding of it. Um, so what happens to make all this work? There are three things that we're looking for in the translation space. Um, and these are all eligible to be contextually configured. Config entities, um, language translation, config translation understands how to read those just perfectly. 
Um, fields, it can handle those perfectly too. Config objects, config objects are the things that actually store like your site name and your um, email address, things like that. Config objects, Core doesn't actually know how to handle those. Um, you have to register them either through a hook or through a custom YAML file, and we'll get to that in a minute. And I can already see people nodding about why this is a bad thing or problematic if you're in contrib. Um, and then it, what it does is it produces these nice lists of things you can translate. Right? What's, what's really interesting here, it's, this is selective. The first thing I noticed is this is very selective handling. Number one, it, yes, it reads config entities and fields automatically. The reason it reads fields, by the way, is that fields are, in fact, config entities. So talking about them as if they're different things is maybe wrong. Only if they're type label or type text. And I fig figured this out because um, I had a thing that was type string, I think, and it wasn't showing up in the translation interface. I'm like, why is this not in the translation interface? Because it has to be type label or text, not string or whatever I had it as. Um, config objects, again, there's, I think there's only two instances of, the, instances of these in core. Module.config.translation or .yaml, those things. Um, that's how it registers uh, config objects, and those also have to be type label or type text. There's a really good logical reason for that. Can anyone guess what it is? Yeah, translatability only cares about strings. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. Um, so, yeah, date and time formats are, in fact, strings. That's great. Um, what's really, really interesting also, though, is that this form doesn't look like this. This is the config translation form, right? This is the regular form. And translate shows up as an operation here, but this information about the pattern doesn't show up here. So the user interface is actually not replicated. We'll talk a little bit about why that is, too. Um, but it's fine. It's great. The, the sort of fundamental things you need to build an interface like this are what's the URL to the translation going to be? What's the URL to the, the base form? Um, and it would be nice to be able to read the base form itself so you can replicate that base form. Um, and what actually happens is when we're translating something, um, they have to do a couple of really weird things in the config translation module. Um, they have to do some route mapping to understand where the configs are so that you can provide those links. Um, and they have to create some local actions. There's a lot of dynamic route handling that you can see a puzzled look. It's, it's weird. Um, this is where things get, to me, really strange. This is the normal form. Um, this is the normal form if you're editing a date format. This is the form if you're editing a translation of a date format. Now, <laughs> you'll notice these are not the same thing. Why are they not the same thing? And I, I can show you. The, the secret answer as I jump ahead is because the code that makes up this form is not readable to anything except the class or a class that extends the class that generates this form. So back in Drupal 6 and 7, when I'm just reading, oh, this form uses system settings form, I can assume it's a system settings form, hooray. Uh, that doesn't even happen anymore. You can't even go in and say, find me all instances of things that look like they're saving config. There's no way to do it. So that's interesting. <laughs> As we find out, UX change is hard, too. There are a couple of things that are happening, happening in config translation that they have to do. Um, again, the forms are all just raw formatting. And then they have these five custom form element handlers that basically replicate form elements based on the type of string they're translating. Um, this is very weird one-off code that makes me cry a little bit um, because it's one-off code. And you couldn't use these either. Even if I could read the elements that were configurable in my module, I, can't, I don't have any access to these classes either. Um, so they're useless to me. So that brings me to the big question. What about non-string data? So setting a time zone is not a string data. That's not a string thing. So config translation doesn't do it. Right. So here's the problem as I see it. We have no support for non-string values. We do not have abstracted code. Um, it's all hard-coded to languages use case. 
which makes me cry. And they only do schema discovery, which is interesting. Um, and when I say schema discovery, they can discover config entities, but again, not config objects. And if you want to say, oh, this is a config object that cares, you, again, have to write extra code for that. So w why is this a problem? This is, so here's, now we're getting into the argument part. Why is this a problem? As me, the domain access maintainer, if I want to build a user interface so that you can change the time zone, I have a couple of options, right? I could certainly just build it, and I'd have to build like a one-off implementation for every variable I want you to be able to edit. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I've done that before. I, I could do that for all of core. I would actually be willing to do that. And then immediately people will come into my issue queue and say, but what about... Oh, the classic for me is always um, Google Analytics module. Well, you'd have to take that up with the Google Analytics module maintainer. You can't support something like this in Contrib. The other problem, of course, is, and some of you who use domain access saw this in the D7 cycle, when the variable API module came in, there was a fork in how do you handle contextual configuration in domain access. And you use my, my way or Jose's way, which are both equally valid, and that's fine. But you have this um, competing solution problem, which might be good at getting the best solution, but is also a huge waste of time and effort, which George was talking about in his session earlier today. So I have no real impetus to do that either. Um, the other piece is we have a lot of single-use code we have a chance to remove. So um, contrib is really not an option for fixing this stuff. Um, so here, my modest proposal. So this is actually what you'll see in one of those config translation YAML files. This is the config translation YAML file for the system module. Oh, look, it's out. You got to the, the uh, proposal portion. So I spent the last half an hour ranting and setting up why I want to make these changes. I'd be happy to talk to you about later. So... These config, dot, uh, config translation YAML files do the following things. Well, they, they do one thing. They map config objects to routes. That's all they really do. Um, they don't help with these other three things that we need. We need to be able to abstract the form handling if we want to replicate forms. Uh, we need, need to be able to link a schema for configuration to a specific route. Um, and we need... The, the way I see it, you need to let modules select data. I said with config translation, it throws out anything that's not type label or text. Well, that's fine. And for its use case, it should. What we need is an API that actually says, here's all the things you can configure. Which ones do you care about? Like, you could write one that just cares about dates. Right? You say, oh, this is a date. Or just cares about Booleans or something like that. So what's, again, kind of weird about this one Again, in the in the YAML file for config translation, all it's really saying is, well, this is a this is a configuration thing. It has a title. Here's the base route if you want to go to its settings form, um, and this is the name of the config schema that it pulls. It's a very weird piece of mapping. And so, of course, my my dumb brain says, number one, why is this not on the route? Why why don't we just add the schema to the route? And Alex will probably have a good reason why, but maybe not. So this is option number one that I recommend we do immediately. Let's add schemas to routes when it's appropriate. Option number two, okay, you don't like that? Let's add routes to schemas. <laughs> I don't want another YAML file that, yeah, just one, one or the other. Either one is fine. This one actually might be better now that I think about it. No? You want schemas on routes? Yeah, it's an interesting, the only interesting challenge here to me is that, I mean, routes are alterable, right? Um, the schema, if, if necessary, yeah. All right, decision number one, we're going to put it on the route? <laughs> That's, that's awesome. So that actually gets us sort of halfway there because once I have the schema on the route, that means I can now build a user interface that says, okay, here are the default settings for this thing, and here are my links to contextual overrides for that thing. Okay? Yeah. You can also put the schema on the class. 
Ah, uh, you, you, you could potentially put the schema on the class. I'm not sure how you would do discovery of, the, of that without well, you, you plugins. Have, uh, it's like the, the entity could have entity form, mm -hmm. you could have core tree form, and then... Uh, that might be available, and I'll show you why we don't do that now. So this is, you could put the route here on, this is, um, this is the base config form that you're talking about, I think. This is the base class. The, the actual blocker here, the reason we cannot replicate, even config translation can't replicate the date string forms is because the, of this, actually of that right there. Right? It tells you this is the config that goes with this form. Oh, but it's a protected function because we don't want you to read that. So yes, you probably could put the route on here. Um, and then it'd be a question of what collecting all implementations of the config form base. I don't know. I'm open here. There, uh, there already is an issue, and it's been out there for like a year. So I, I have a list of issues. I have issues. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one is actually a little more challenging. Custom form submit handlers um, need to be accounted for. In the, in the old, olden days, when we had um, systems, system form submit, what I used to do is read whether or not that was the only submit handler on the form. And if it had more than one submit handler, I would ignore it and say, I'm sorry, this form is too complex for me to handle because I can't, like date, the date stuff in Drupal 7 has like complex handling of form submissions that I couldn't replicate. So this is an interesting question and you do have to answer the question of can you, should you actually be able to contextually override any setting via the user interface? Yeah, and Alex is like, no. There are certain things we should ban, we should bar, right? And I can tell you this because I've worked on it in the schema API, uh, not the schema API, the, the config override API. One thing that you cannot contextually configure is a domain record because if you try to do that, it creates an infinite loop because the domain records are looking for domain, it's, don't even. So yes, there are possible exclusions to things where we would say, this should never be overridable. I don't know. That's, that's... Yeah. What, so what Alex Pot, the, the, are you still the CMI maintainer? So Alex Pot, the CMI lead is saying, please know you cannot put the, it's, um, um, yeah, core.extension.yaml should never be contextually available. And that's perfectly legitimate. And there's probably three or four other cases, right? Um, but a good one, a nice one to test is, I like time zones, great test. Um, I also love, um, Maintenance mode. <laughs> I love to contextually configure maintenance mode for that. That's a lot of fun. Um, custom. Huh? Maintenance mode is not in config? <laughs> it's in state. Oh, my. I haven't even thought about the issue of contextual state changes, and let's not go there. I'm, I'm really only concerned with time zones. Keep it simple. Time zones. <laughs> My two use cases, time zones and Google Analytics codes, which might actually, well, they're text, so they might actually be, anyway. Um, here, so here are the blockers. If done correctly, it actually is going to cause a major rewrite of con config translation because what you'd want to do is rip out all of its custom code, abstract it so that everybody could use it as a baseline API. I, I was pointing out, Alex, that like there's, five or six custom form element handlers that are single purpose in config translation. Moving them out would be a good thing. The, the whole discovery process that it uses could all be moved out. Um, I don't know. Um, so there, there's the big blocker. Test cases. This is the other big question. Does anyone else actually have use cases for this? Let, let me ask this question since everyone sat through this much. How many people care about this issue? Okay. What's funny, what's funny is when I asked how many people knew what domain access was, like 90% of the hands went up. 
And when I just asked how many people care, about 40% of the hands went up. <laughs> so I told you, this is like the nerdy corner of the nerdy corner. This is like very much out there. So th that goes to the title of the session, right? Number one, can we do it? Well, kind of. And the other issue is really, do we care? Do we actually care enough to get this done? Um, because otherwise, my, op my statement to people right now is, well, yes, you can, you can override variables on a per-domain basis by editing a YAML file. Here's instruction on how to do that. And I'm OK with telling people that. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with that if that's what we decide to do. Um, yeah, so my, here's my related issues. Uh, allow discovery of configuration UI. That's the issue that I filed. That's the big rant, basically that has all the details in it. Uh, yeah, make get editable config names public. That's been out for a while. Um, the other one that's, that's there that I don't think we've cracked is this one, which is actually kind of nasty. The no indication of config on configuration forms if there are overridden values, uh, which is a really nice UX piece and really important, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it. But those are the three big issues here. Um, and that's all I have prepared. So, yeah, questions, solutions, people want to take free time, I'm not going to be offended. It's 10 after 4, which means we finish very quickly, which is great. Uh, are there questions? If so, there is a mic. It might be better if somebody could pass it around. Getting up might be hard in this tiny room. Um, about your question there, about the last question. Uh, I was at the session before this about configuration, and he talks about um, you have two different modes of fetching configuration, either uh, by mutable or non-mutable. Mm -hmm. So you can see it uh, either fetches as a read-only value or a read-write value. So in that case, you should be able to detect if it's overridden. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Alex, do you want to come up so you can like share the mic and be recorded? You don't have to. Again, you, I only know enough to solve the problem that I have. Um, and so I could be totally wrong about most of this stuff. But these are, the, again, the blockers that I ran into. So the, let's repeat the question, and you can repeat your answer. It might be helpful. Because they're recording. That's all right. The question was about Immutable versus non-immutable configuration, and doesn't that help you in the UX? Yeah, and, and so if you look at the, the, the final issue here, there's a lot of discussion about when, uh, when do you want to tell the user that it's overridden, or when do they just know it? So if you're looking at a translated configuration form, telling them that that's overridden is the whole point. It is overridden. You're, you're editing the override. Or are you just looking at the, the, the first part, the, the normal form, the untranslated <laughs> bit, and if that bit's over, over in settings PHP, what does that mean? And how can you identify the actual form element that's related to the thing that's over in? We could never make it work, so that's why there's been no progress. Um, but ideally, if you have an override in settings PHP, the, the form element would actually be disabled because you can't actually change it. Um, so what, what happens, <coughs> well, no, not disabled. What happens now in, in we, we changed, we swapped the behavior bet between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, if you override something um, and you go and edit the form, the override will be set to the value and then you save it and then it'll actually get saved to the database. In Drupal 8, we get the unoverridden value and we put it in the form so that you can deploy changes which aren't from your settings PHP override, which is a better way, but it's hidden from the user. But it's, yeah. it's, but it's also very confusing in Drupal 7 when you go and you, e you press edit on a form and you change a value and you press save and it doesn't change. <laughs> and then go press save again. Why not? Why not? And then eventually you go and look in settings PHP and then maybe there's another include in there to an environmental file to include, to include, to include, and you eventually get to why it was over in the first place. And it, it's probably worth noting, right, there are at least two different ways to override config in core now. Right, you can still hard code things in settings.php or you can use, like I'm doing, I, I actually load schema files. Well, partial schema files. Um, 
and knowing which is which. Like in Drupal 7, I'm always editing the conf array dynamically. And in 8, I want, I, as a module maintainer, I want everything in config. I want everything in YAML. Um, and that would cause me problems too, actually, now that I think about it. Like, so we'd need, we'd need a way to identify, oh, this came from settings.php, which would basically mean, oh, Joy probably setting some global thing that you could read and say, oh, well, yeah, okay. Because sometimes, because of the reason that the state is not reflected in the form, you can't configure anything. Like if you have your overwritten search API and it validates on save or in a magic map or in, like, you know, if your module, if you overwrite some part of the configuration, you actually can't use it in the backend anymore. Because you can't save it to all the other settings because it's in one form. Um, am I aware that there are issues with environmental overrides? Is, that, like, or is, there, I is there a solution to the environmental override problem? I think because it's related, because yeah. the domain is somehow only an, an environment, we could ex expand the use case uh, that we have. Like, there are many sites which require different solutions yeah. or configuration per environment. You know, that's actually probably a good way to get at this problem. Instead mm -hmm. of, like, if, if, the problem that I'm laying out is we need an abstract API for doing configuration overrides. Probably the use case that we could actually get into core is development environment, right? And so you could have... Uh, okay. I'm just remembering the pain of like, I know. dev prod toggle issues. I know. Two yeah. years of arguments about like how many like types of environments you want. Right. Well, you just... That's, that's actually solvable, right? Again, um, I, again, my code's naive, but it lets you do... Partial overrides of any schema you want to. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> That's awesome. And I don't even see... There's no. um, so, right, I can, I can create um, a domain-specific config file. I can even create language-specific domain-specific config files that contain partial config overrides. We could certainly do that, and it would give us a use case that everyone could agree on. Um, and you'd end up with a file that was something like right, environment dot name of environment dot name of config, and boom. I can see it. The problem is, the problem that I have without that you missed was I don't think you can write that module in contrib right now. You yeah, could write the, the you could write the management piece, but then there'd be no UI for it. It'd be just like you get with domain config, which is well, here's a way to load environment specific. You wanted a module that would load environment environment specific config files. I could show you code I have now. You could have it done in two days. Mm. So, like from my perspective, what you're yeah. saying is like I've been waiting for someone to like take the over, like the, the the base work that we did with overrides yeah. and and generalize it, and it's like complete music to my ears. It's like wow, at last someone has taken the idea because it, getting um, configuration schema into core, we we wrote it three times. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after getting the idea of schema and building the config translation on top of it, it took a lot of time. So it's, it's not a surprise that there are bits which are less reusable than others. Right. And, and the stuff that you're saying about trying to get more information into uh, be, to be discoverable mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. I want to see things like being able to control the list of allowed values or regexes on the schema so that you can, mm -hmm. you can validate configuration much more just using the schema and build whole forms from the schema so you don't need to know anything about it. Chris, how are you doing that in between building forms from typed data? Yeah. You're doing it with typed data, just something that's actually yeah. typed yeah. configuring type dot. Yeah. Um, so that's in the last three years. You're saying, yeah, for again, the recording, someone is actually building forms for typed data but not for typed config. Right. And the point I was making is I don't want to build forms for typed config. I just want to steal the forms that already exist and piggyback on them and that, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Right, you're just talking about like going through schemas. It is possible to go through the schema, whether it is what kind of data it is. You can go through schema and get what you need yeah. and display a form. Because in, in the form, like as you kind of look at the differences between the form of translating and the thing, like there are differences. 
know, like Tanya said, you know that once you're overriding something on one form, and not on the other. Yeah, but those are all developer tools, right? They're great for developers. They're not. They're not interfaces I would want non-developers to look at, essentially. My opinion. Are there other questions? Are there people eager to take on this challenge? <laughs> you don't necessarily have to rewrite config translation. What you can do is actually just write it so that config translation then can start taking bits and pieces. But I would, unless you have a better idea, I would start from the use case of environmental overrides. It's, it's one that's required and most people mm -hmm. have a use case for. Yeah. And then if we can build it so that we, we, we have the discovery, uh, we need discovery, we need form handling, and we need the sort of what, the, the blacklist. The, uh, these are things you cannot alter. Of course, funnily enough, one of the primary concerns that people have with environmental overrides is to be able to have modules installed in mm -hmm. development, oh, right. like Devel and stuff, so they want to overwrite the core extension stuff. So. Maybe, maybe there's a way to say this module actually doesn't have an install hook and therefore is safe to just turn on and off it. Yeah. Baby steps. Yeah. Small steps. Um, if anyone wants to talk about it more, I'm happy to stick around. Otherwise, there's plenty of things to do in lovely Dublin and at the conference, and I give you some time to hear some. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't make it to the beginning. The, the piece you missed was me saying, oh, we worked all this out in 2013 when we were in Dublin the last time. And